Good evening, everyone, and welcome to V Brown Bag. We are very pleased tonight to have Exploring V Realize Operations APIs presented by John Diaz. We always invite you to get into the conversation. We love to be interactive and not handle any questions and give any sort of uh, follow up and feedback. So if you'd like to talk with us tonight, uh, I'll be on Twitter monitoring at V Brown Bag and hashtag V Brown Bag. So if you have any questions, comments, or funny pictures, go ahead and tweet them out to hashtag V Brown Bag. We are also across the world and uh, in all different time zones. So if you can't make it to our uh, US shows, sometimes maybe you can make it to the uh, European shows or Latin American shows. Uh, just join us. It's always a good time. It's always some great learning. So with that, I'd like to take a moment to introduce my guest, John Diaz. John, can hey. you say about yourself? Yeah. Hey, hey Tom. Thanks. Uh, glad to be here. I'm, I am John Diaz. I'm a, a technical marketing manager uh, for VMware. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. I work in the cloud management BU and uh, basically been with VMware for uh, almost seven years now. It'll be seven years in January. I've been in this role for for about a year. It would be a year this uh, end of this month. Uh, and previous to that, I was a uh, SE um, and a specialist. So my area, especially uh, at VMware, is uh, currently around the vRealize Operations family. So vRealize Operations login site. Um, you know, basically all the stuff in vRealize Suite standard. Uh, v realized business for cloud and so forth. Uh, but tonight uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of my, uh, just like Tom, this is a passion uh, for, for me as uh, automating stuff with vRealize operations. So we're going to cover the REST API. Uh, we're going to talk a little, about a little bit more too uh, in, in terms of what we can automate uh, outbound from vRealize operations uh, to other APIs, including some of the APIs you've seen before uh, in the previous sessions, the vSphere API and VRA, um, if you watch those sessions. Um, Tom, can you see my screen? Uh, I should have supercharged vRealize operations slide deck up. Yep, it looks uh, looks good to me. I'm okay, great. Feedback and says people are saying it looks good on the feed too. So take it away. Awesome. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so uh, what we're going to cover tonight is uh, I'm going to answer a couple of uh, you know questions of, of why, and, and you know one of the reasons that I proposed this session, and I'm, I'm glad that you know folks at V Brown Bag uh, allowed me to do this, is you know when it comes to APIs and automation, people don't really think about our operations stuff as being part of that universe, if you will. So we'll talk about some use cases or why customers. Uh, why we I've seen customers or work with customers that would have wanted to extend VR ops, um, you know, using uh, scripts, uh, APIs, and, and so forth. We'll go over, of course, the REST API that uh, comes with vRealize operations. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, VR ops module for Power CLI, and Tom, you have some experience there, so hopefully we can we can draw on that as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, if time allows, we'll talk about uh, automating alert notifications with something called webhook shims. Um, it's a little bit different than, uh, uh, you know, the using the API, but uh, it is a powerful capability that allows some progr programmatic extension of VR ops that I think uh, everyone would be interested in. So I'm assuming that you've already seen the other webinars on VMware APIs or you're familiar with VMware APIs. Uh, and uh, if you watch those, uh, at least with, with Kyle and Jad, they did a good do job talking about Postman client and how to use some of the basic features there. I, I was really glad to see that because that will save me some time tonight in not having to explain some of the more basic stuff. So I apologize if, if, I, if I use, if I go into Postman and I kind of skip over like, how did I get here? Please feel free to ask, but uh, I'm, I'm just trying to compress this as, as much as possible. So why extend VR ops? Uh, here's just some common uh, use cases. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, there is the capability to basically uh, 
you know, pull out information out of VROps or manipulate information within VROps through the API, but you can also use things like alert notifications to trigger integration with other products like ServiceNow for opening uh, tickets or sending notifications or chat ops uh, type use cases. Uh, and then a lot of times people like to just pull out information out of VROps because they want to combine it with other information from other, other monitoring tools and systems. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is definitely a valid use case. We actually have a tool for that uh, that's, that's now a fling, but it leverages the API. It's basically someone wrote some Java code that leverages the same APIs you're going to look at. So you could use that tool or you could, you could roll your own. But the biggest thing to me is that, you know, when you think about operations in an IT environment and you hear, you know, you hear all this noise about DevOps, um, you know, they, they both have ops in the name. Uh, and so we shouldn't, as, you know, as, as IT operations teams, we shouldn't be afraid to dig into this type of stuff. And I know the people attending these sessions are, are, are very much uh, believers in that just by virtue of, of your level of interest. Uh, but it would behoove you as an IT person to become more familiar with this stuff because the world is changing uh, and uh, being stuck to, you know, uh, stranded at a, a UI or even a, a command line is uh, not going to cut it uh, for, for the future. So for your own career benefit, I think uh, it behooves you as an IT person to, to understand this stuff. So let's jump into the REST API. I am going to do some demos. I just have this this uh, slide presentation here, uh, just to get some points across. I'll definitely make sure that we share this through. Uh, Tom, I, sh I assume you guys have some mechanism for sharing. If not, I'll, I can tweet it out on my on, on my channel. But uh, yeah, the you, uh, uh, document. If you tweet out a link or something, we can put it in the show notes, no problem. Okay, awesome. So I'll do that. But uh, they're really, uh, the, the documentation is a little, bit different with VR ops and what you may have seen from some of the others. The others that uh, were, were showcased, the, the uh, vSphere uh, and the, and the uh, VRA, have a more modern kind of swagger uh, documentation set where you can interact with it. Uh, VR ops still today is still kind of a static, uh, but very useful, um, uh, very useful uh, documentation set. So I'll go into you and, and into it and show you how to use it. It is located on the um, uh, device itself or on the uh, appliance. So when you deploy VR ops, uh, the uh, URL or URI here will take you directly to this uh, the, the page where you can get started uh, with that documentation. So let me, instead of going through slides, I'm going to cover the stuff that's in these slides uh, and and uh, do it live instead of kind of boring you guys with the details. And then you can refer to the slides as kind of backup. So you can see here that I went in my lab to uh, the IP address of one of my uh, ops nodes and dis, just did sweet uh, dash API. And this allows me to get to the welcome page. Now, a couple of things on the welcome page. Uh, you can go directly to the REST API documentation, which we'll do in a minute, but there's also different clients. There's a Python client, there's a Java client. So if you are uh, using either one of those languages or you prefer to use uh, one or the other, then it may behoove you to look into those clients. Uh, I'm not going to cover those tonight, but I just want to make sure that you were aware that those were, were available to you. So we'll go into the REST API documentation and Across the top, what you'll notice is that uh, your uh, the first tab that you you land in is public APIs, and these this is basically the working set of everything that you know is available uh, to you. So it's broken down into APIs for uh, you know things like actions, adapters, uh, all the way down to uh, credentials, resources. Uh, there's a section of alerts, report definitions, etc. Uh, the biggest area where I think initially people spend most of their time is in the uh, resources API uh, because that's where you can start to extract information from VROps and then later you can use this to inject information into VROps like add properties to a virtual machine if you wanted to or if you wanted to create your own metrics and pump those in 
uh, you could certainly do that. You can even create your own resources uh, as well. And, and one example of that that I'll talk about uh, later is creating uh, an endpoint operations manager uh, remote monitor programmatically through the API instead of going into the, the UI to do that. And the reason you would do that is if I wanted to create uh, those in bulk, there's no way to do that through the, through the UI. Uh, then you know I could leverage the the uh, API to do that and create all of those remote monitors. Say I wanted to monitor uh, a, a service or service monitors, I should say, not remote monitors. Say I wanted to monitor, uh, you know, I don't know SSH on uh, you know hundreds of servers. Uh, it would be better for me to use the API uh, to do that than to go in and create those. Uh, if I wanted to monitor a service on a new VM that was spun up through vRealize Automation, uh, then I would use the API as, as part of the extensibility in, in VRA to automatically add those, those service monitors, for example. So just some examples of things you would do. Uh, after, uh, in addition to the public APIs, we have internal APIs. Now these are available, they work. Uh, they, uh, they, they work quite well. The problem is, is that, as you know, they may not be supported in a, in a future release. Uh, doesn't mean they're bad or they're going to blow up if you use them. What it means is if you write some code that leverages these, then you, you should be aware with every release you need to verify that, that, that API still works with your code, that nothing's changed or it hasn't been deprecated. Uh, hopefully, it's been moved into the public API. The most common one here that people use are create and manage custom groups. Um, so this is probably the most popular one. I have some examples in Postman that I can, that I can show you uh, on that, but that's probably the biggest one uh, that, that people use. Uh, the next tab is model representations. Now, this is important when you get into the API and you're looking at, for example, uh, you know, some examples on things like creating a resource. So let's go down to um, uh, create resource using adapter instance, okay? When you look at uh, this uh, API, it tells you, you know, what the API does. And here it'll show you samples, you know, so kind of like with the, uh, with the other documentation, the more modern Swagger documentation that you've seen presented for some of the other APIs, we still have examples. It's just not as dynamic as those where I can actually try it from here. And this is really why I heavily rely on Postman uh, for, for testing, at least initially. So the samples, uh, they'll show you uh, both XML and uh, JSON format. And uh, as you look at these, you may be wondering, well, what, you know, what is all this stuff? You know, what are all these fields? What do they mean? So if you go down here, you'll see that there's usually, uh, you know, for something that's a post or a put, uh, some, you know, some API that writes something, uh, there's usually a request body content, and it points to a data representation that uh, is in this model representations tab. And all you can do, all you have to do is simply go uh, click on it and it'll pop you right over to that uh, namespace. That's what NS stands for, uh, to that resource namespace. And then here are all the different fields that you would use in the body of that request. Uh, the data types themselves, you know, of course, a description, the data types themselves and whether or not it's required. Okay. So you can kind of use this as a roadmap to figure out you know, when you look at that example, uh, because the, a lot of times the examples that are given will have all of these fields. That doesn't mean that you need to include all of these uh, in your in your request, just the ones that are required or just the ones that you want to modify. You'll also notice that some of these refer to other uh, data models. So, for example, uh, badges or resource uh, status state and you just click on those and you can you can you know figure out uh, you know what components of those you need to include as well um, and 
the other thing that you'll see too is that um, you'll have things like let me find a good example uh, this is a good one so you have this namespace uh, resource relations and what this is is basically a container or an array however you want to think of it um, I don't have a coding background so I'm probably really abusing uh, the, the the language or the syntax here but uh, it's a container for one or more of uh, the resource relation uh, type uh, so uh, that's uh, you know you'll see that kind of thing that just indicates to you that you'll have to format your XML or JSON payload uh, to accept an array of, of these types of, of objects and indeed when you go back and you look at the example um, get back to the example here you can see that that's that's kind of what they're showing so the examples are really really good for sh uh, for getting you started um, and then once you kind of have a general understanding or you mocked it up in um, sorry I can't talk and point, point the mouse at the same time once you mocked it up in postman um, then you you know you don't have to usually come back and refer to this unless you want to you're doing something you know vastly different I, I would usually go just directly to the model representation uh, for anything else okay so you can see here like here's an example of the XML I'm, I'm much more of a JSON person so you can see for example this resource identifiers is an array that's the square brace there and JavaScript indicates uh, or not JavaScript uh, JSON indicates that that's that's uh, you know uh, an array of objects and this would be the uh, you know resource identifier um, a data model okay so hopefully you know hopefully you kind of get the gist of how to you know uh, navigate through or what the different parts of the API documentation are the other part is uh, the other parts that I'd show there is a waddle uh, and an XML schema if you have some software in, in fact I think uh, even postman will ingest these it's been a while since I've looked at it but uh, something like soap UI uh, if you're doing you know API testing with SOAP UI uh, you can import the, the waddle or the uh, XML schema and um, have all the API's loaded into into that software for you to use so that's there and then uh, if you want to use this I actually don't find this terribly helpful because they're not in any particular order that seems to make sense um, but uh, that is there so for whatever that's worth probably the best thing to do if you're looking for a particular API is to just good old control F and say you know resources and uh, use that kind of methodology to navigate your way around now having said that John yeah, we question? Got one. Uh, I've got a question from Graham he says is there any way to automatically verify internal API's or is it a question of reading the docu or docs every time well, what I would do if, if I if I wrote, first of all, there are not a lot of them. So if you wanted to do an eye test, you probably could. Uh, my recommendation would be uh, if you have code written uh, that that particularly if you have code written that uses internal APIs, but probably public APIs as well, it wouldn't hurt. Uh, I would test your scripts against a test instance before rolling you know before upgrading your production instance that's probably the best way and then you could come in and and you know once you if your code doesn't work uh, and you know it's a particular API then you could come in and investigate it I haven't seen a lot of movement in this space since I've been working with these API's for a few years now uh, I've seen some stuff added like upgrade the agent for uh, as they add new features for things like endpoint operations and they added the uh, agent upgrade um, I, I actually used this before it was available in the product uh, it's a, it's still there uh, I don't know why it hasn't been moved into the public uh, at some point it may if it does if and when it does uh, you know I would hope that uh, the request uh, stays the same it may not 
So it's always a good idea to just test uh, your your code before you you do a production upgrade. So hopefully that Graham that helps. Uh, good question, by the way. Thanks. The other thing is uh, uh, Paul Gifford, uh, really really sharp guy at VMware. Uh, there was a project a while back, uh, maybe two years ago, uh, called Project Platypus, uh, and uh, he was one of the guys involved in that. And he actually uh, modified or, or pulled the uh, VR Ops API. You can see it's pretty old. It's the 6.2. So it's been a while since he did that. Uh, he pulled this into that project, and the whole idea behind that project was to was to take our older API documentation and make them um, Swagger-like. So if you want to, you can come uh, here. This is on VMware Code, and it's the API Explorer. You can come here, and you can you can look at this in Swagger format. Uh, just I'd use it with a grain of salt because uh, it is a little bit older. I don't think it includes the internal APIs, um, but for the most part, for the for like the most common ones that people would use, it's it's probably okay to, to use this. So if you prefer Swagger, I do, I like Swagger a lot. Uh, it's just, I don't, uh, it's not, uh, the official documentation is not in Swagger. So I rely heavily on uh, using using this method, not the prettiest thing in the world, but it works, gets the job done, and it's 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 you know dead on accurate, and the examples are really good too. Okay, so let's move from uh, there. Let's talk about authentication. So I'm just going to pop back to the slide deck real quick. Oh, uh, here's another thing I wanted to mention, and we'll we'll look at this actually in the. Um, when we do some of the examples. Uh, a term you may or may not be familiar with, I certainly wasn't before I ran into it, but uh, Hattios. Uh, don't ask me what this means uh, off the top of my head. You can hit, you know, hit Wikipedia and look at that, but it's basically like a self-referential documentation or self-documenting you know, self API. So when I make a call to get resources, for example, to look up, you know, a VM or something. Uh, what you get also in that response body are these links, and the links provide you with other URIs that you can go to that may be helpful that are already pre-filled. So if I wanted to see alerts for that resource, I don't have to go back out to the documentation and figure out what the API is for that. I can just click on this link right here, and it'll take me to it. So this saves you a lot of time, especially like I've used this even programmatically uh, to to just look up the uh, href programmatically. Uh, it's also really helpful in, as you'll see in Postman, you can click on these links and then, you know, uh, actually save it in Postman. So you, you have it uh, for uh, perpetuity. You don't have to, you know, go back and look it up or anything like that. So that is helpful. Uh, authorization supports either basic uh, or token based. If you're doing basic authentication, uh, then the local is the default. Otherwise, you need to provide the auth source uh, as uh, part of that uh, username uh, along with the password. Let me show you what I mean. So if I have you realize operations manager here and I have all vCenters or I have my different vCenters or I have, you know, my AD or, you know, John's AD or whatever I call it, um, that name that appears here is what you would use as the auth source. Again, if it's local user, if it's the admin account, you don't need to include that, uh, but that's that's what it's looking for otherwise. Uh, the way I prefer to do, would do, to do uh, authentication is token-based authentication. And I know that uh, that was talked about in some of the previous sessions, but basically it's a, a bearer token. It's uh, an OAuth uh, authentication methodology, and it basically you you send a request to get a token, and your credentials are included in the body of that request. You'll be using a certificate, you know, SSL communications between 
the uh, your client and VR ops, so all this will be encrypted on the fly. But uh, what will be returned is a bear token that you can then use uh, for further uh, uh, further API requests. Why do I prefer this method for VR ops? Uh, it's well, a it's it's probably good practice. Uh, just basically, instead of having your username and password everywhere, but uh, for VR ops in particular, uh, there is a penalty if you're doing a lot of REST calls. Uh, if you use the basic authentication, then it goes out and authenticates that ID every time. If you use token based, uh, it's going to be a lot quicker. It's just going to say, "Yep, this token's still valid. Uh, go forward and 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 uh, seek your." your fortune, my friend. And so uh, use that, that's, a, that's kind of a performance tip as well. I have some other performance and best practices just to keep in mind, uh, you know, again, use bear token for repetitive uh, REST calls. And if you're making a lot of queries, I see this uh, a bit, not a lot, but I see this a bit with uh, when uh, customer, I'm trying to help customers use this. Uh, if they want to get a resource, for example, they want to get like all VMs that start with the, you know, they, their name starts with the letter M or has SQL in it or something like that. So uh, what I've seen them do is do like a get uh, API resources and like do, you know, like, and you'll see how this works in the example, but, you know, name equal, you know, and then SQL, something like that. Uh, and then they'll, they'll like keep, making that request for every you know type of iteration that they want to uh, retrieve VMs for or even if they have the resource IDs they'll make one get request for each VM this is not a good thing to do it's okay if you're doing a single request to get a resource if you have hundreds of VMs uh, to do or even tens honestly tens of VMs uh, it's better to use a query. And so you'll see in the API documentation, and you'll even see in some of my examples, it'll say like, get something by query. And what this means is that you're probably going to have to build out a, a request a payload body that uh, has your criteria for getting those resources. It's a lot faster for VR ops to respond to this. There is a penalty also um, on your cluster, if you have a lot of users hitting the web server and stuff like that, this is also going to put uh, you know a, a load on that. The response time for those users is going to be slow. Those users in the UI is going to be slower if you're really pounding away on the API. So it's better to optimize your code for that. So hopefully I didn't uh, pound that uh, into the ground. Uh, this is my. I'll tweet this out too, and I tweeted it earlier today. Uh, I have this on, on uh, VMware Code website as, as well, but I have a uh, VR Ops Postman collection in GitHub that you can um, you can use. Uh, and if you downloaded it earlier, you can follow along and uh, and and uh, and ask questions if you run into to problems as we go through this tonight. So let's talk about some of those use cases. Uh, in my uh, example, a couple of things from the download, you'll get all this stuff. And every time I update these use cases and, and so forth, uh, Postman is automatically going to push those out and merge them with my GitHub repo uh, where I've got this stored. So it'll always be up to date. That GitHub repo will always be up to date as I make changes or, or improve uh, some of these use cases or add new use cases. Uh, to this. I also have an environment uh, that uh, is provided uh, you can download and it's just example uh, uh, information in here. The bare minimum information you need uh, is basically the VR ops IP address or FQDN uh, username and password and then the bear token will actually get at automatically added for you. So these three are the only three that you really need to get started with this. And I'm just going to go to my uh, other example. So in my lab environment, you can see that I've got a lot more uh, environment uh, variables here in my environment. And these are actually added uh, as I make the request. Uh, so nothing to really worry about here, but you'll probably see these as you play with some of the examples. 
you'll see this grow um, and you'll see these additional uh, environment variables used and you'll understand in a minute what 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 they're doing there so the first thing I want to do is authenticate and of course when I authenticate I have that username uh, password I do have the auth source in here just you know because it is an example I don't have to have it uh, it's automatically soon to be local yeah. Tom was there a question yeah there's a question can you share the github repo URL again yeah sure let me go back to the slide deck all right I don't know if there's a chat or something we can put it in or actually I can just tweet it and and yes Graham the yeah, Stephen says thanks so we can keep going yeah, and we will have okay. the slide deck in the show notes too yeah so. cool Thanks. All right, good. Yeah, um, and, and any feedback on this? I mean, and if you if if you all want to contribute to this, you're certainly welcome. Just let me know. Hey, you know, there's a use case. Let's add this, or I added this use case. Please merge it in with your with your stuff. I'd be happy to do that. So anyway, my body. You can see, you know, of course, I'm using those variables. I think this was covered in some of the earlier sessions. Uh, you know, that that used Postman, but I'm just taking the user. And password, uh, as well as the VR ops uh, IP, uh, and then I make that request. Now I have a test that's running, and it basically just takes that JSON response body and extracts that token information uh, and puts it into a variable called bearer token, which is here. So you can see that it's uh, you know basically the same number, uh, the, the same GUID. And now I have my authentication is, is set. Now this is sort of the way you would use this programmatically in some code like Python or, or JavaScript or something like that. You would, t I, when I've written uh, like Python scripts uh, that use, you know, that do stuff with VR ops, this is like the first thing I'll do is actually have it go out and do that authentication and grab the bearer token. And also as I'm reusing it, I'll just validate that the, uh, validity this timestamp on this is is valid and this is just a uh, an epic timestamp and you can go to some website like uh, epicconverter.com and you can just either you know pop that in there it'll show you notice everything that we do with VR ops is in is in milliseconds uh, so be sure to use the full milliseconds, not the epic uh, that is just the second. So I think milliseconds adds what, like three numbers to the end? I forget. But um, yeah, so uh, and and this is kind of an important concept. It's not a big deal, but you'll make heavy use of this because VR Ops is a monitoring tool. There's a lot of different requests and queries and things that are timestamp driven. Uh, so you'll want to, you know, have some, something like this that you're comfortable with using to be able to to, to do that the type of thing. Uh, but anyway, I would just check that timestamp just to make sure that it's it's valid. Uh, there's also the expires at. You could just copy that and do a check. It's probably a lot easier just to do uh, the validity timestamp. Let me see here. Uh, yeah, so the validity timestamp you'll notice is you know tomorrow. Uh, at you know 703 um, a.m. Uh, so um, just another little tip for you uh, there it saves some time and just um, I've even written subroutines that go or uh, functions that say is it valid if not you know refresh the token as long as you keep using the token uh, then it will it will renew it'll it'll stay uh, fresh so you don't have to worry about that but if uh, in some cases, I've written scripts that go out, grab a token, and just wait for somebody to make a request. So you'll definitely want to, you know, if you're doing that kind of thing, you'll want to make sure that token's valid. Now, some of the popular use cases that we have here, uh, probably the most popular one is around resources. People want to just get, uh, you know, find a virtual machine 
and get information about it. What I like about this is um, this is a lot quicker and a lot of times I'll find myself doing this popping up Postman and running this query uh, or, or running this API instead of going into the UI, logging in, searching for it, and, and so forth. There's a couple of reasons. One, because it's it's faster uh, than you know you know do, going through all those steps, and also you get more information uh, con in a concise place about the resource uh, than in the in the UI. What I mean by that, for example, here is the VM ID. Uh, this is usually virtual machine you know v, uh, virtual administrators typically you know, live and die by these MOID um, numbers, right? When they're trying to troubleshoot problems or they're looking at logs, things like that. So that's there as part of the uh, resource identifiers. Uh, you'll also see, of course, the, the uh, VM name. You know, this is a VM object. The uh, VCID, uh, you know, that uh, uh, ID of the virtual center, that manages that virtual machine. Uh, you can also see the state, uh, as well as the different badge scores. And then here are those Hadios links, those referential links. So now I can start doing different things like, well, I wanna see the properties of this VM. I click on that and you'll notice what happened is it opens up another tab within Postman. And I have Postman set to already just pre-fill the headers for me with those VR ops headers that I want with the bearer token uh, and my uh, accept header. And all I have to do is click send. And now I've got the properties for that resource all here. Very easy, much quicker for me to get to. Um, even if I'm not using this to write scripts or anything like that. Uh, now what I can do is I can, you know, obviously search uh, this within um, uh, within Postman, if I if I want to do that, um, uh, you know, or if I like the way that this, you know, this is this is some bit of uh, this is a good API. I want to use this, and I want to put in my code. I would click the code button and say, yeah, I want to do this in Python requests. And there you go. It gives you the all the code that you need. You just copy that to clipboard and pop it into your into your code. Uh, you may have to make some adjustments. It adds some annoying stuff like the postman token and cache control. I usually take those out. Uh, but this is another reason why I use postman. Not to, I'm not getting paid by those guys or anything like that. But uh, the the reason that I use postman to test APIs and and kind of test things out before I script them is because a lot of times I don't know what script language I'm going to use. I don't know if I'm going to use, you know. Um, I don't know if I'm going to use Python. I don't know if I'm going to use uh, JavaScript, uh, if it's going to be a shell script. Um, you know, maybe I just want to send an example to a customer in curl. You know, it's like, yeah, just run this and it'll give you everything you need. So it's a lot easier for me to just have those APIs uh, examples here and then be able to pop out and get the, get the code. Okay, so properties resource, that's pretty easy. Uh, the biggest thing that people want to see, though, is they want to get stats from a resource. So in uh, in this case, so I've got a uh, resource. Uh, let's see, we'll take this. Uh, it's, this is a VRA machine in our lab here. This is probably Jad's machine. Uh, and I'll go down to the identifier. This identifier is the uh, GUID within vRealize operations. So this is an important piece of information. Every object within vRealize operations has an identifier that looks just formatted similar to that. So if I wanted to get the stat keys for that resource, you see I have a resource ID, um, a resource ID environment variable. So I'll just fill that in. We'll just work with that one and send. Oops, I'm missing out. Oh, it's coming back in XML. I'm not. 
I'll just add accept because I don't like working with XML application JSON. Send it again. Um, and there you go. So I have all the stat keys. Uh, and these stat keys are uh, when you're in VR Ops, for example, pull up a working instance or that I've already logged into. If I go into VR Ops and I look at an object and I go to the All Metrics tab for an object, you'll see the metric, the different uh, metric keys listed here in, in plain language. But uh, what when you're working with VR Ops programmatically, this is not the name that you want to search for. In fact, sometimes it doesn't even match. This is like the friendly uh, human readable name, and this is the, the actual key, uh, the key name. Uh, so to get the real, the actual key names, uh, you'll want to do that through the API so that you can get the exact format, spelling, you know, everything for those. Uh, and then once they're listed here, I can then take and get um, the stats uh, for that um, uh, for that resource and for that stat key. If that makes uh, hopefully that that makes sense. Um, another way that you can retrieve stats uh, and notice I have the not query here. So this is an example of of something that I may do for a uh, single, um, you know, resource and not, you know, in mass or anything like that. But I have um, this API resources, resource ID slash stats. And then I have a query here. This question mark uh, starts a query. And I have a begin period, an end period. I have things like interval quantifiers. Interval type is day. So I want one day. Roll up is average. And then my stat key, mem host usage. Okay, that's uh, actually probably, I probably should have just stuck with whatever. Actually, you know what, let's take, let's use that one. Let's go back here, let's grab, uh, let's look for something CPU. CPU. Uh, There we go, mem guest usage. We'll do mem guest usage instead of CPU. Okay, so we'll do stat key, mem guest usage. Okay, uh, now you'll notice I have a couple of, uh, you know, I have that resource ID, I have the, and then I have for the begin and end, I have an epic variable. Right here in this example, I've created a pre request script that basically grabs the current time and then it uh, creates a variable with that timestamp and then it also creates a variable that goes back 24 hours so basically this begin and end period is from from now back 24 hours and then of course that's why I have the days roll up and everything like that so let's when I send that this is actually this actually runs uh, uh, this pre-request script and it pre-fills my epic so we can see that that is the oops that's not right it should be the, the current time uh, copy okay so the current time and then the um, oh, actually, that's uh, okay. No, that's right. Yeah, my time zone. Sorry. Um, and then the next one should be if I wrote this correctly, which I assume that I have. I hope I have because I've been using this for some time. Okay, and then that's the previous twenty-four. So it goes back to yesterday, yesterday evening. Okay, so. I'm grabbing the past 24 hours for that, and then here's my return. Here's my timestamps. You know, it's basically one day average, and then here's the data uh, for that uh, right here, my mem uh, guest usage. So that's that's an, an example of a single 
uh, query. I have examples in here. I want to move on because we're we're getting close to the to the hour here. But uh, I have other examples for just getting like top end stats, uh, getting uh, you know multiple resources, and then getting uh, so here's a bunch of resource IDs. You would obviously change these for your environment, um, it, but that's an example of you know getting a bunch of uh, resources uh, through a query instead of doing them one off. This would be the best practice, and then you could do things like you know get uh, get the stat keys for those, and then get like top end stats, for example, uh, for those. Uh, the other uh, one that's uh, a frequent request, probably not as popular as doing stuff with resources like getting statistics and things like that, is uh, adding those resource monitors that I mentioned. So I have examples here. Uh, this is kind of a multi-step process, uh, and you'll learn that with with APIs, particular with particularly with VR ops. A lot of times you're dealing with, uh, you know, I have to fetch this information first before I can fetch the next bit of information, and that's what's really going on here. So if I want to add a service monitor for a Windows uh, EP ops agent, endpoint operations agent, I can do that, uh, you know. But first, I want to get uh, the agent that is going to be, you know, monitoring that OS. So I can look that up by name. You know, I can do some match here and go, yeah, give me, give me the agent that starts with IIS. And then I get that uh, agent uh, name and I take that and I pull it into uh, a variable as well. And then I can get the, uh, the resource ID uh, for the OS itself. Uh, I'll need that because I need to create relationships between the service monitor and the uh, resource that I'm monitoring. So here, next, I would go create uh, a Windows service monitor, and my body would describe that service monitor. You're going to want to refer to the documentation on this, at least initially, until you know what you know all these fields are. Uh, some of them I have variables. In, you'll notice that agent ID is right here. I've got to have the agent ID in a couple of places um, in the uh, payload just so that this uh, monitor that I'm creating to monitor Windows uh, time service understands which agent it belongs to. Uh, I'll send that off. And when I send that, uh, send that off, I got a 422. Actually, I think I, oh yeah, it already exists. I did this uh, earlier in the week. Uh, I forgot to go in and delete it. But once I create it, then I have to create a relationship between that uh, monitored resource and the, uh, it needs to be a child of the OS resources. That's why I had to grab that OS resource ID. And then I would run this, add a child resource to a resource um, to make that happen. And then the last thing I have to do is actually start monitoring the resource. So these things are done like behind the scenes for you normally. If you were to do this through the UI, you know, you don't think about all the steps that are involved. Uh, so when you're doing this programmatically, a lot of times, you know, you have to understand the, all the steps that are involved. And it took me a little while to kind of put this together and figure out, well, I got it created. Why isn't it monitoring? Oh, I need to start monitoring. So, but the good news is that, you know, once I figured this out, I have this here, and then you can just take all of these and then use that nice code function in uh, code snippet function in, in Postman and use them in your, in your scripts. Okay. I'm going to pop out of Postman and talk about a couple of other things before we, before we wrap up. Uh, hopefully that gives you a good idea for, you know, how to use it, the things that you can use it for. Uh, talk about uh, Power CLI. I know a lot of folks are big users of that. Uh, the module was introduced uh, a couple of years ago. It still has the same basic 12 uh, commandlets uh, that are there, authentication. Uh, there's some Git resources and alerts. I actually have a uh, blog on this. Yeah, I have it listed here. Uh, where you can go out and, um, you know, run through some of the more basic stuff and then pulling uh, metrics, uh, a.k.a. statistics, uh, 
in, from VR Ops through Power CLI, getting recommendations for alerts, for example, handling alerts, you know, uh, canceling them or taking ownership, that type of thing, and even using the full API through the plugin itself. And I was talking to to Tom about this earlier because you know Tom was sharing some work he had done uh, using with VR Ops and, and Power CLI. And uh, I, this part three, uh, I, I think it's kind of interesting that we can do that. For my money, it's probably easier just to, you know, take these um, uh, these examples here uh, or do something in Postman and then make just a, a regular REST client call from PowerShell uh, than to try to do it uh, through this mechanism. But it's good to know, I guess, how to do either one of those. Tom, anything to add on this? I know you worked with that a bit. Or... Yeah, so first, uh, I've got a few questions that uh, came in before the uh, Power CLI part. So okay, sure. It's from Stephen. I recently installed the VMware Service Discovery Management Pack. I have not looked yet, but will there be, will that adapter be available via the API? Yeah, so all the adapters are essentially, but um, they're not uh, called out specifically. So we don't have, for example, let me get back to my uh, API documentation. So we don't call out specifically uh, APIs for uh, VMware adapter or anything like that. What you have is this generic adapter kinds uh, uh, API, and that allows you to modify, configure, add um, adapters. And then once you do, once, assuming you have an SDMP installed and, and you have an adapter configured, you could conceivably uh, manipulate those services that are discovered by Service Discovery Management Pack through the resources API. So it's not cut and dry. It's not like, yeah, if you're using SDMP, use this set uh it's you have to think more generically when you're when you're dealing with the with the api so hopefully if that let me know if that answers your question or not but yeah it's, kind of, it's a it's a multi-part question so it says i'm okay. uh, researching if we can stop using service now application dependency mapping and feed relationships from vrops into the C service now cmdb also, how can I execute the running of a report on an object and retrieve the PDF or CSV from the API? Is that possible? Oh, yeah, that is possible. Uh, let me take that second one first. I love this. Um, I have a reports example here. And so, again, uh, there are a few things that you need to do. Uh, if you don't know uh, the report definition uh, that you want to run, uh, you need that that name. You can run this report, get report definitions. It'll come back with all the different reports that are available. Uh, we'll let that run in the background. And then uh, once you have that, then you can actually generate a report uh, using this uh, post uh, method. And in the body of the report, you have the report definition ID. So let's see if this finished over here. So here are all the reports. And so here's one report definition. This is, uh, this is actually from the VOA, the vSphere Optimization Assessment. Um, and so this is the phase one report. If I want to run with this report, I would just grab this ID and then pop it into this body. Uh, and I'll also want the resource that I want to run that from. So in the case of like, I'm running this optimization assessment, typically we run that from a uh, cluster or from a data center. So I would grab the object ID for whatever data center, the resource ID from whatever data center that I wanted. And if you remember, uh, you know, everything's got an ID. So that, you know, that identifier field would be what you need once you find the resource that you need. Generate the report. Once the report has run, you can get the generated reports from uh, the API. So it'll show you all the reports uh, that have run. I think it'll actually even show you the status. Yeah, the status if it's completed. And then once you have the report 
the generated report ID, it's, it's finished running, take that ID and then you can run the download reports and then on that you can specify the format, CSV or PDF, okay? So uh, following this example should give you that ability to programmatically run and retrieve reports from VR Ops. The other question about ServiceNow, uh, yeah, you can pull stuff out of uh, VR Ops, bring it into ServiceNow. Uh, this is where we get into the webhook shims. I don't, we're not gonna have a lot of time to cover this. I would be happy to do, this is almost a topic in and to itself, but this is talking about, let me go to this slide right here, uh, where we take the, the rest notification. So, you know, alert notifications, we can send emails and things like that. One of the other things that we can do is we can send out a REST notification to a REST endpoint, uh, and that's called a webhook. It's like, hey, I'm making a call back to another system to do something based on this alert condition. The problem is that's proprietary. This this payload is is a fixed proprietary payload that you can't change um, today. Uh, so we need something called a shim, and that shim uh, is where we get the name webhook shims. That shim will translate the VR ops proprietary REST request to whatever the destination API, and that service now is one of those, Bugzilla, PagerDuty, even Orchestrator, et cetera, uh, and it'll add whatever authentication you need and we'll forward that information. So if you wanted to, based on alert condition, open up a ticket in service now, or you wanted to update a CMDB in service now uh, because an object, uh, you know, the memory configuration changed or something like that, and you want that VM to be updated in the CMDB, you can do that. If you're adventurous, and we're gonna go out and look at that now, you can go to my, uh, not my, uh, this isn't, I contribute to it, but it's not my um, uh, project. This was started by Alan Castingway and uh, Steve Flanders, uh, whom a lot of you probably know, um, from, you know, from his blogs on Log Insight. But basically, you can go out here, check it out. We have all the documentation. I've even got this in a, uh, there's even a Docker install that you can do uh, for this. Again, probably another topic for another day, but just to answer the, the question, um, it, it is definitely possible to integrate um, with, with ServiceNow and, and automatically pump you know, information into, into ServiceNow. But that would be the way to do it is through webhook shims. Uh, otherwise, you would be, you know, if you didn't want to do it based on some alert condition, then you could just, you know, write up uh, some code or program that would just use the API, extract the information and forward it on in some scheduled basis or something like that. So, uh, okay, yeah, and I, I wanted to get back real quick to the, the power uh, CLI piece. Uh, Tom, I just real quick pick your brain on. I, you had mentioned some stuff you had done and your experience with this. Um, you know, just any thoughts you had on, or any additional information on that. Yeah, the uh, the Power CLI um, modules for VROPS. I'm glad to see that they're getting you know, more attention. They're getting blogged about, and they're becoming more full featured. Because six eight months ago, I was working on a script to to do a health check on a virtual machine instead of having to go to three or four different places and it was almost like the wild west at that point trying to figure out how to uh to figure out what the recommendation for cpu size was on a virtual machine yeah it's it it can be daunting uh i think uh again and it <clears throat> excuse me in this blog series one of the things that i actually point out is you know you even though you're using Power CLI module for VR Ops, it's probably helpful to go ahead and pull up the uh, VR Ops API documentation because it helps to explain, especially the model representations and so forth. It helps to explain a lot of that stuff. Like, how, I want a daily average, or I want I want an hourly average for the past week, you know. Or, or the maximum, how do I get that? You know, what, what, what keywords do I use? What does that look like? Or is it even possible? So the, the module itself doesn't really explain that. All the capabilities are there. 
you'll need to go to the API documentation to get the full details of that. So good, good, good point. And uh, that kind of feeds into a question from Graham of what's the uh, timeline for making the Power CLI module fully featured? Uh, that I don't know because that actually, uh, if, if, if Kyle's uh, around listening, I saw him tweeting earlier, he may be able to speak to that. He'll, he'll probably say, hey, uh, when, when John tells me, you know, <laughs> what other capabilities we need in it. So I think a lot of it depends on, um, I mean, anything's possible. It's a matter of uh, resources and time. So uh, I encourage people to give feedback, you know, either through Twitter or social media, whatever, or directly uh, to, you know, uh, myself, people like myself or Kyle, hey, I, I wish you had this capability in there. And we can then prioritize those uh, instead of, you know, trying to wait and get everything in. Uh, we can focus on the things. It'd be much easier to focus on little bits that are important to people. So um, any feedback along those lines is greatly appreciated. Awesome, thank you. So yeah, so that's all. I'll be sure to get uh, this information out. Like I said, this deck's got you know kind of a lot of a lot of good information in it. I hope this was uh, you know useful. It was very quick overview of <laughs> of the VR Ops API. But uh, please, you know, please reach out to me with any questions or or feedback or um, things like that. I'm more than happy to t talk to anybody about this. This is definitely an area of passion for me. All right. I've uh, been answering some questions uh, and telling people to contact you. So you may, you may uh, have a lot of tweets coming up pretty soon. Yep. No problem. Not a problem. All right. So um, can you want to go through and tell people how to contact you re again real quick? Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Probably be a good idea, and I actually I have a slide for that. Uh, yeah, so uh, my VMware email is actually backwards, uh, so it's dsj d i a s j at vmware.com. You can certainly email me there. Uh, at, on Twitter, I'm at John D Diaz, and uh, my GitHub uh, repo is there as well slash John D Diaz. I've got a lot of uh, different examples, uh, you know. Um, for, for using, uh, I think I actually have the PowerShell, some uh, 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 Power CLI for VR Ops examples out on that repository as well. So um, good good place to check out. So yep, ping, ping me. Uh, always always happy to talk to folks uh, as they're exploring this stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. It was a great session. We'll have to uh, follow up on those. Uh, web hooks and shims that, that sounds yeah. really cool yeah absolutely let me know i'll be happy to come back and we'll we can do a we can do another hour on on that for sure all right um and i guess with that we'll call it a night so thank you again john thanks everybody for for showing up thank you good night good night everyone